Good morning, I'm Sharon Farb, and uh, we are so excited to be at CNI and present the preliminary results from our research study. I'd like to introduce the research team. There's Peter Broadwell, Martin Klein, Todd Grapone, and myself, all from the UCLA Library. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about the format of our presentation this morning. Uh, I will give a few introductory remarks, just kind of situate the context of the research. We really want to spend most of the time on, on exploring and exposing with you the, the research findings so far. Uh, and then uh, Pete will describe the methodology of the research. Martin will give uh, some highlights of the preliminary findings. Todd will have some concluding remarks, and we've tried to save time for some questions and discussions, including how we might collaborate with interested CNI members to uh, do some further research on aspects of this together. So I'd just like to highlight a couple trends <coughs> that provide context and kind of situate the research. So um, as everyone knows, there's rising costs, there's a growing, a significantly growing research corpus, particularly in with respect to uh, science, the sciences. Um, there's an increase as well in research funding. Let me pause for a minute and just highlight what's on the slide about the, the cost, the revenue with respect to STM, and in particular journals, because journals are the focus of our study. And um, journals are about 40% of the STM market, and of that, uh, 68 to 75 percent is coming directly from subscriptions that libraries have. Um, another trend that is just a, particularly in the last few years important to highlight is the significant increase in particular in open access journals in the sciences and we'll talk some more about that in a minute. And then the other one I want to highlight that isn't new, it's in fact been a constant in scholarly publishing is the critical contribution of our faculty and researchers in the production of the scholarly literature. Elsevier conducted a study using University of California data, and this chart comes from the UC University of California Impact. This is a chapter from the Impact Report uh, on publications, and the Elsevier study found that uh, one out of every 12 research publications published in the U.S. Uh, were created by University of California faculty. Um, it would be fascinating to do a study and explore what the contribution of CNI members, faculty, and researchers are in the production of scholarly literature. One might imagine the results of that study may show something like 10 out of every 12 publications. Uh, Um, everyone is familiar with this chart that shows the correlation, in some ways, the gap between the steady increase and the rise, again, of journal publications as well as book public publications with respect to the consumer price index. What people may not be as aware of is the study that was conducted in 2013 by the National Association of State Budget Officers. That found that just under half the states in the United States, so 24 states, um, we're operating with uh, general fund expenditures at the 2008 level. So that means those of us that are tied, universities that are tied to public funding and state funding may likely, at least some of us, not even be at flat budgets, but budgets that are skewed to 2008 levels. Uh, this chart comes from a study that was published in PLOS entitled Open Access of the Scientific Journal Literature Situation 2009. And in 2009, uh, the authors found that approximately 25% of the research publications in the sciences were at that point uh, open access. And the chart is, you know, you can see the green and you can see the gold, but collectively it was around that much. Uh, in 2015, there was a study uh, where the authors found 
sorry, I have the title of it, but that study found that 61.1% at this point of the journal literature is now freely available online. Our study looks specifically at the contents of archive, the physics and math focused uh, institutional, uh, sorry, repository that's hosted by Cornell. And their operating budget, including everything, uh, was just over $800,000 for the period from 2013 to 2017. Uh, in contrast, we can't tell you specifically what the corresponding cost is of those final published, but we do know that, you know, the STM US is about $10 million, so somewhere between 1% and maybe 15% is what that number likely is. In any case, we can say that it is likely 10 to 15 plus times the price of archive. Um, in the STM report uh, 2015 that was authored by Michael Ware and Michael Mabe, they describe the value-added roles of publishers. The one we focused on for this study, it is a content analysis, is the copy edit. <coughs> we have two working assumptions just like to briefly highlight. They are that if that publisher's claim with respect to copy editing is valid, then the text of the preprint print should differ in some form from the corresponding post or final, and that by applying um, measures of similarity, we should be able to detect and quantify such differences. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who's going to describe the research methodology and the data collection. Uh, thanks, Sharon. So I'll just jump right into our first uh, methodology slide. Um, so as you can see, uh, we assembled uh, two different corpora. Uh, uh, if you're going to compare pre and post prints, then you need to uh, have, have a good number of, of both of those categories. Uh, so um, when we were uh, collecting our preprint corpus, uh, as, as Sharon mentioned, we, we focused on archive.org. So most of the papers we, we collected have something to do with uh, physics and math, primarily. Uh, and so we actually uh, ended up downloading pretty much everything, uh, at least all of the, all of the PDF uh, uh, papers that are in our, in our archive and also the metadata associated with them. The metadata is available through an OAI PMH interface. Uh, the PDFs you can download through Amazon's uh, S3 service. Uh, Archive has an account. Uh, they have a requester pays set up where uh, we pay to download them. Uh, it cost us about $60 to download all 500 gigabytes of uh, archive papers. Uh, this is totally above board. It's all on their <laughs> website. They say you can do it. Uh, and, and we paid for it, so, so we didn't cut into their $800,000 uh, uh, budget at all. And. Um, uh, Archive also keeps versions of, of preprints. We uh, use the latest uh, available uh, if there were multiple versions. Uh, and as Martin will explain later, um, uh, it, it was this was uh, using the latest version was okay. We, we, we were able to ascertain that we were still working with preprints, not preprints that ended up being postprints. Uh, to gather the um, matching postprint uh, corpus, we extracted the DOIs from the metadata that was available through Archive. Uh, they don't actually assign DOIs, but authors can go in and, and uh, add the DOIs later. Uh, so about 44.5% um, of the articles in an archive have these DOIs. Uh, we, and then we use those uh, to, to look up the same uh, articles in their uh, final or postprint version uh, through the Crossref um, API. And uh, Crossref, uh, for, some art, for some articles, allows you to download the full text in XML and also the, the metadata for the articles. Uh, assuming your institution has subscriptions to those journals. So we were able to take advantage of UCLA's um, wide range of serial <laughs> subscriptions uh, to, to access uh, um, a large number of papers that way for the comparison. Um, once we had both sets of, of papers, we did some uh, uh, processing to, to get them ready for the actual text comparisons. Uh, we converted the PDFs to XML uh, when, when we could. Um, using fairly standard, uh, you know, open source tools for PDF to XML conversion. Uh, we suspect they might be the same ones that publishers actually use when they're submitting their papers to uh, Crossref. Uh, we don't know about that for sure, though. Uh, and then we extracted the various sections of the of the articles uh, from the XML. The XML does a pretty good job of of uh, of uh, 
delineating those sections for us. Uh, occasionally, though, some are missing. Uh, we found that this was a fairly insignificant statistical noise in our, our overall uh, analysis. Um, but certainly there is, uh, uh, when you're working with a large, when you're automatically processing a large quantity of, of texts, uh, so there's go go always going to be a little bit of slop. Uh, we also extracted um, metadata and some contents of the papers from Archive's uh, OAI PMH interface, which gives you access to the metadata, but that also includes the titles and abstracts. Um, one issue with this is that Archive allows, because it's primarily a science and uh, math, uh, or physics, yeah, physics and math um, archive, they, they allow authors to upload these sections with the LaTeX markup still in them. Uh, and uh, that, that leads, to, that causes some problems for comparison. So we actually favored the versions of the titles and abstracts we could get from uh, the PDFs instead for that reason. Uh, and then we um, just applied some, some basic uh, text comparison algorithms to these, these uh, sections of the papers that we we're comparing directly to each other. Um, there's six listed here. I'm only going to talk about the top three. Uh, the results from the bottom three are actually quite similar to uh, the results from the, uh, the, the uh, algorithms in red. Um, but we do, we do have a, a web interface that uh, we'll provide the URL later that you can go to to browse the results from all of the comparisons. <coughs> so. Um, these are fairly straightforward text comparison algorithms, so, uh, and I'll, I'll just outline them very, very quickly here, but I'll try to make it as painless as possible. Uh, so the first comparison is just the, the length, uh, computing the length ratio between, say, the preprint abstract and the postprint abstract, uh, which is just, as it says here, it's a ratio of the shorter text to the longer text. Uh, we have an example here. Uh, so you get a nice number, uh, and if you get a number for all, a whole bunch of abstracts, you can start to, to generate some, some good results graphs from, from those. Uh, as with all of these other similarity metrics, uh, any th you know, the closer you are to one, the more similar uh, the text that you're comparing. So our second method was uh, a fairly well-known Levenstein edit distance algorithm, which is a number of edit operations necessary to turn one text into the other text. We have an example here showing that it takes three, uh, three edits, either insertions, uh, deletions, or substitutions to transform the left string into the right string. Uh, this, uh, this algorithm is, is often used in uh, uh, like spell, checking, uh, spell checking functions on word processors to say, oh, did you mean this word? Uh, particularly when it, the word doesn't show up in the dictionary. Um, and so we actually used, uh, to compare the papers, we used the ratio, uh, which is a slightly more complicated formula uh, where, you add in, where you, you, know, you add together the uh, lengths of the, of the text and then subtract the edit distance uh, in the numerator and not in the denominator. So you can kind of intuitively see here, if the edit distance is zero, then uh, the numerator, numerator and denominator are the same. So the, the similarity would be one, which is very similar. Uh, but the, the more uh, the edit distance increases, then your similarity score will go down. Uh, so Levenstein is good at sort of quantifying um, editorial changes. You know, it catches at anything including changes in capitalization, punctuation, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, which, which is, is useful because this is one of the, one of the uh, areas in which publishers can contribute uh, value to, to the postprints. Uh, and our, our, third, our third method was uh, a contrast to, to Levenstein uh, at a distance. This is cosine similarity, uh, which is slightly more complicated to, to explain uh, in, in full. But all we really need to know is, is that it, um, it tends to ignore uh, superficial editorial changes and instead focuses on uh, significant words within the text and um, is more sensitive to changes to words that are actually characteristic of a given text. Um, so as it says here, you know, common stop words are ignored, uh, words that are more characteristic within the whole corpus, uh, more characteristic of a particular text within the whole corpus get greater value. So we have our, I have an example here. These are actually uh, the preprint and postprint titles of, of a particular <laughs> paper in our data set. Uh, you can see as we, as we begin to run, uh, cosine similarity does the normalization, gets rid of the capitalization, uh, ignores the, the stop words. Uh, and then uh, just I, I did some uh, syntax highlighting to show sort of intuitively which words are more characteristic of these texts and would get more weight. Uh, the word light is not all that characteristic, but it's also not a completely uh, unimportant word. And so that the addition of that word is actually what changes, what makes the cosine similarity not one and drops it down a little bit. So um, just to give you a visual uh, <laughs> overview of the sections that we compared, we have, we have a paper here. Um, 
written by uh, written uh, by some people in this room. Uh, <laughs> that uh, just, just really briefly we'll show you the sections that we were able to parse out of the preprint and postprint. Uh, so we, yeah, there's the title and the abstract. And um, then after that, we, we grabbed uh, all of the text in the, the body of, of, the, uh, of the article, not including the title and the abstract, or in the end here, the references. Oh, there's also the authors, uh, which um, uh, both the authors and the references are fairly difficult to parse, so the comparison of those sections between the uh, preprint and postprint, we've mostly left for uh, for future work. Um, but breaking out these sections uh, gives us um, lets us examine um, more more closely the differences <laughs> and the, the character of the differences between preprint and postprint compared to or relative to if we were just to look at the raw text only. Uh, and so now um, Martin will uh, talk about what we <laughs> actually found when we did this. Right. Thank you, Pete. I need to apologize for my voice. I'm uh, getting over a cold, so if I sound like Joe Cocker, this is not a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Um, so some preliminary findings. And as mentioned before, this is a uh, study in its very early <laughs> stages. So uh, while we're confident that what we're uh, going to share with you today is true, there's still much more work to be done, right? So um, maybe um, a couple more slides about insights into the corpora that we have generated. Um, Pete mentioned that we downloaded all of archive.org. This is roughly 1.1 million articles. Half of that, give or take, had DOIs that we could use to match their uh, postprint uh, version to. And um, we came up with a total of 11,000 articles. Right? The ratio is pretty bad, you know, but uh, it's still, we felt it's still a, a good enough size corpus to uh, go ahead with our study. So starting with 1.1 million and up with 10,000, that's not all that great, but uh, it's, it's still good enough for you know, a preliminary study. Most of the papers that we matched um, uh, were published somewhere between 2003 and 2015, which intuitively makes sense if you uh, consider when A publishers started um, uh, assigning DUIs to their uh, scholarly work, and B, when you know, the use of DUIs really became uh, more um, ubiquitous, let's say. Authors became aware of DUIs, uh, uh, went back maybe to archive and put their DUIs in the metadata set. So that date range is not particularly surprising. What was a little bit surprising, however, is that the vast majority of the postprint papers that we found were published by Elsevier. Uh, granted, this is an SDM corpus, and uh, Elsevier, uh, and that's probably the reason for this uh, high percentage there, Elsevier was, as far as I know, the first partner for Crossref for their uh, API to provide the full text of the, of the articles. So the vast majority of um, uh, postprint uh, articles that the Crossref API will uh, provide is uh, actually uh, Elsevier content. So these are you know a few dimensions of how our data set is specific, let's say. I don't want to say biased, but specific. Um, the journal that had the most papers um, represented in our corpus was uh, Physics Letters B. I had no clue that exists, but apparently it does. So uh, uh, just, you know, if you know what that is, <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. Uh, another um, histogram showing you the uh, distribution of categories in our archive corpus. So archive gives you the nice categories, right, where your uh, papers are submitted to. And everything in red here is physics specific, everything is blue, in blue is not physics. So again, a certain specificity of our corpus, mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of papers are from high energy physics, there's a little bit of math, the second column there. Um, and uh, the other non-physics categories is uh, computer science, quantitative biology, uh, statistics, and quantitative finance, I believe. But that's the long tail there. Again, a corpus uh, focused on SDM, in particular, you know, physics C uh, uh, um, articles. All right, uh, results, right? Finally, we get to the results. So the next three slides that I'm going to show you uh, have a, um, a graph on it that look very, very similar. As Pete mentioned, uh, our similarity uh, measures are normalized, so you get values between zero and one, whereas zero on the right-hand side indicates a very, very low similarity, and the value of one indicates a very, very high similarity. So left is high, uh, uh, right is low. Uh, the b height of the bars uh, represents the total number of uh, papers referencing to the left y-axis, and the red dot on those bars represents the relative number in percentage of papers referencing to the right y-axis, right? Make sense? Good. Um, here in this, um, what this slide shows you is, oh, and, and, and to make this, this graph a little bit um, more readable, we bind those values into categories. So values that fall between 0 and uh, uh, 0.1 are in the first bin, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 in the second bin, and so on to fourth, and the last bin on the far left uh, values that fall between 0 0.9 and 1, okay? So what this uh, graph shows you is the similarity of the titles. Pete mentioned that we extracted different um, sections from those articles. This is the title only. Um, 
so for example, the length uh, ratio of the titles, uh, more than uh, or roughly 10,000 articles had a length uh, ratio very, very close to one, or somewhere between 0 0.9 and 1, meaning uh, the length is almost identical for uh, roughly 90% of all titles. Well, oh, what, what? that was not the plan. <laughs> all right, this is the Wi-Fi kicking in, doing something. Let me just, mm. sorry about that. Where's my cursor? Oh. Nope, that was okay. all right. Here we go. Okay. Um, where was that? Oh, so the uh, the length of the titles is very very similar. Now you can of course say you know the terms cat and dog have the same length. However, they are very dissimilar. Granted, hence we do the other metri m metrics, right? So uh, Levenstein and Colstein give you the notion of how significant uh, the changes were. And since these values are again very very high for the top bin for the 0 0.9 to 1 bin. Uh, that indicates that there's no significant changes in the, uh, in the titles there either. So for example, Levenstein uh, comes in at roughly 70% uh, in the top bin, and the remaining 20-something percent are distributed over the, uh, uh, the second from top bin, somewhere between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9, and a little bit curious enough, uh, roughly 10% in the bin uh, of values between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, so that uh, uh, um, demands for further investigation why that is, but it's an interesting result. All right, so there was a title comparison. Now we know that titles are fairly similar. Well, this may or may not be surprising. So we looked at the abstracts as well. Again, as Pete mentioned, we extracted the abstracts too and looked at, why would you do that to me, Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, the ab abstract comparison. And the picture there, as you'll see, is fairly, fairly, fairly similar. Uh, and the length um, ratio and the Levenstein distance is uh, dominated by the top bin. So the vast majority of those values, uh, more than 80% fall into the bin that holds values between 0 0.9 and 1. So again, indicators, strong indicators that the abstracts are very, very similar. You also note that the uh, cosine similarity uh, ranges in about 60%, so that's a bit lower. And the only explanation, the only reasonable explanation that you have for that is there are not a lot of character-wise changes in those abstracts, but the few that there are may be entire terms uh, that somehow changed the, you know, uh, maybe um, uh, slightly changed the semantics of the um, of the abstract. Hence, the cosine is a little bit lower than the the Levenstein distance. But you'll also notice that the remaining 40% of cosine uh, uh, come in in, in, the, in the second to top and third top, so it's still very, very left heavy, right? Even though it's not as dominated by the top in as uh, um, length and Levenstein is. All right. Then we did the uh, comparison of the entire body, so not the title, not the authors, not the abstract, not the references, everything in between, basically, uh, and come up with those results. Very interesting as well. <coughs> as, uh, maybe you know that uh, cosine similarity works fairly well or works better on longer uh, text than it does on shorter text, hence the whole notion of um, um, contextual um, um, uh, salient terms that it catches up. And if we say 80% of our articles come in with a cosine similarity somewhere between 0 0.9 and 1. So that should drive it home, right? Uh, the, t the body of those articles is, contextually speaking, very, very, very similar. Uh, you'll also notice that <coughs> excuse me, the Levenstein distance is higher for the second to top bin, so somewhere between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. Uh, examples for that, a, oh, I'll show you in a second. One example was that we found um, a lot of preprint uh, papers would have um, a, a different way of referencing papers. So you would see, you know, as has been shown in related work, uh, reference one, reference two, reference three, reference four, and in a postprint uh, corresponding version of that article would be, as has been shown in related work, reference one dash four, so one through four, right? Levenstein picks up because it's character-wise and uh, uh, um, um, a substitution. Uh, cosine doesn't pick up on that because it's the same thing, right? So that's the point. Um, yeah, maybe one example really quickly. This is the abstract of a paper uh, published in Physics Letter B. Um, that uh, highlights the differences that we found that our tool picked up on. And uh, this might be hard to read, so let me really uh, quickly point out what uh, particularly Levenstein here picked up on. So uh, forming a color, glass, condensate, whatever that is, uh, is capitalized in the preprint version. It's lowercase in the postprint version. So again, Levenstein picks up on that because it's not the same. Cosine says this is the same thing. Um, there's a capitalization in the term letter uh, for postprint, but not for preprint. Uh, and interestingly enough, on the bottom right, if you can see this, in the postprint version, or no, rather in the preprint version, there's the term parametrization, 
and in the post print version it's parameterization. So they inserted an E because this seems more correct or whatever that is. But you know, those are the sort of differences that we did find that our Lowenstein um, uh, similarity matrix picks up on. So this was a lot, this was very fast, I realized that, so we made it a bit more convenient for you and built a website that uh, <coughs> uh, contains all those histograms. So if you, if you fancy, you can go to sologlow.library.ucla.edu slash prepost. I just tweeted this link as well, uh, because we're in this time of the uh, year, right? So uh, I tweeted about this, you can go to this website, you can, where's my cursor now again, here we go. Yeah. You can say, uh, give me all the uh, cosine similarity values for titles, and I also want the um, Levinstein ratio for titles. So you get the Levinstein ratio for titles, and if you scroll down, the cosine titles. So this is for you, you know, you, uh, a takeaway message if you go home, if you need some homework, <laughs> uh, go there at home and uh, uh, check this out. All right. <coughs> So now um, you, you often hear the argument, well, is this a, a physics preprint? And I've actually done it myself that I had a paper accepted at a, a commercial publisher and then I uploaded it to, to archive for you know, good measure. And the other way around as well, of course, works as well. I've done this too. I have a, um, a tech report somewhere, this long version that no one wants to read, so I put it up on archive. Later on, I said, oh, this was actually not too bad. I submitted somewhere, maybe a shorter version of that, and it gets accepted. So the notion of sequentiality, of what comes first, is, I think, important to, to consider. And so we extracted the publication dates, the reported publication dates of those um, articles as well. And here's a, um, the distribution of that. Everything in red was published on archive.org first. Uh, binned again into uh, date ranges. The black line there is to distinguish because the, uh, the size of the bins are a bit misleading. Everything right of the uh, black line is a bin size of 100 days. Everything left is a bin size of 10 days. So we have roughly, uh, let's say, a thousand papers um, that were published on archive.org first uh, between 40 and 50 days prior to its postprint corresponding version. Right. So that, um, at least, at the very least, gives you a notion that uh, there's no, it's, it's, it's not necessarily true that Archive only holds you know, the open access version of your postprint uh, uh, article, right? Because the sequentiality is at least uh, distributed, let's say. All right, one more slide, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, Pete uh, uh, hinted on that, the author similarity, that was really intriguing to us. However, it's not trivial to do that. If everything had orchids, this would be cool, but unfortunately, we're not there yet. So uh, extracting authors is not that hard. Interpreting the names is hard because the concept of a first name and last name is not unique across the world, right? <laughs> uh, metadata is messy, as we all know. So uh, we have examples where the, m the first name and the middle name are labeled as first and last, and then the actual last name is labeled as the first name of the next author. So all kinds of crazy things happening. If, again, right, if you do experiments at scale, crazy crap will happen. <laughs> so uh, here's well. However, what we are we're able to do with some heuristics uh, we can make a safe statement saying that we found uh, roughly 80% of the author lists are identical, meaning the, uh, the length of the author, the number of the author is the same, and also the order of the author <coughs> is the same. That's for 78%, uh, uh, however, that leaves 22%, right? What, what, what's up for those articles? So that's uh, an aspect for future work. We'll uh, need to look uh, further into this. Um, but that's as far as we want to go with the state of the results we have to date. All right, that was it for the preliminary results. I'll hand over to Todd, who will cover a few aspects of future work and spark a discussion. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, so uh, this is obviously pretty preliminary work. There's, there's more to do. Um, uh, Martin Pete hit on some, um, uh, some aspects of the work that, that need to be refined. Um, and uh, we'd like to get, uh, I think, to uh, uh, different kinds of content as well. Um, and also uh, use this work um, uh, to overlay with uh, other impact factors to see, um, uh, you know, just see if we can uh, spark some discussion and, and ask some questions about um, uh, uh, those other um, measurements as well. Um, we'd obviously like to uh, move into different disciplines um, we feel like uh, uh, what we've done so far um, is pretty good, but you know, um, there's a really a pretty good chance once we get into other disciplines that we're going to see these changes um, uh, that we can measure uh, uh, move a lot differently uh, when it comes to different disciplines. Um, and uh, we also are interested in uh, in collaborators. So one of the um, 
uh, things we're trying to do, and we're going to do in the future, is put a, a web API up so that you can uh, compare your own content in the way we've done it in your own corpus uh, and come up with your own results. I'd be curious what you guys think that you'd be interested. We have our own ideas about next steps, so we want to look at some other disciplines. Um, we want to do some qualitative work. This is obviously all quantitative work. Um, but we would be curious what folks that are hearing about this might be interested in and how we might collaborate together. So we did save time for that. If people have any questions or would like to uh, talk about areas that you're particularly interested in, then that would be really useful to us because this is just. Thanks so much for coming. Again.